Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to EMC 225. We are recording now, so uh, let's finish up with our diabetic emergencies, and then hopefully we'll be able to swing right into anaphylactic uh, emergencies as well as drugs. Uh, I will get the PowerPoints to you for the rest of today's lecture. So we're going to jump right in and talk about DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. And typically we see DKA with type 1 diabetics more so than we do with type 2 diabetics, although it can occur with both, with both patients. Now, when we're looking again, as a reminder, type 1 diabetics produce no insulin. Type 2 diabetics, the body cells have become resistant to the insulin that's being produced or the insulin that's being produced is of a lesser quality. Therefore, the blood sugar has a tendency to go up. Now, the big thing that we're looking at with diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA is the lack of insulin. And again, when we don't have insulin, then the blood sugar continues to go up and we begin to see symptoms. Here's a key thing to remember when we're talking about DKA patients. DKA patients will take hours or more likely days in which for signs and symptoms to begin to exhibit themselves. Now, the body is going to find some way to manufacture energy one way or the other. It will either utilize glucose, and if the glucose is not available, then what it will do is it'll turn to cannibalizing itself and now begin to break down fat and protein. The problem with breaking down fat and protein as an energy source is that it leaves behind a ton of waste products in the form of ketones, or these can be called ketone bodies. Diabetic ketoacidosis, in the name itself, tells you exactly what's going on with your, with your patient. So number one, your patients are going to be acidotic. So we're going to see that pH begin to swing over towards the acidotic range. The other thing that we will see with these patients is that they will have really severe dehydration. And as such, generally what we will see early on, and with, this is going to be true, this is one of the signs and symptoms of new onset of diabetes as well, is that these patients will be going to the bathroom a bunch to urinate, okay? And they will be very, very thirsty. As the glucose continues to rise, then our patient will also begin to vomit. This leads into some electrolyte abnormalities. When the patient has this ketoacidosis, the ketones is what's leading to the acidosis, hence ketoacidosis, this type of acidosis is going to be different than lactic acidosis that we would normally see if, Landon, you decided that you were going to go out and, and run or exercise. It's just That's just the normal acid that builds up from use of the muscles. Ketoacidosis, on the other hand, builds up as a result, again, of the body using protein and fat for its primary energy source. Again, this comes because... There's no insulin, and if there's no insulin, there is no sugar or glucose that's able to go into the cell because of what reason? Why, why is insulin so critical for us as humans? Good, Devin. So it opens up the receptors. It makes the receptors larger. Again, just by way of review. The receptors on the cell are too small for the larger glucose molecule to enter. So insulin comes along, acts as a key, opens that up, goes in, everything is normally going to be going to be okay. The other part that comes along here is that our patient now begins to move into a type of anaerobic metabolism. Okay. So if we're beginning to leave behind lots and lots of waste products for our particular patient. Now, ketoacidosis and lactic acidosis 
is are, are two types of acidosis, but they're not related to each other. Two entirely different mechanisms. One comes about as a result of normal metabolism. The other comes about as a result of a breakdown of the body's processes. Now, generally what we're looking at here is that your patients, like I said, they will become very, very acidotic. They will also become very dehydrated. This is as a result of your patient's profound urination, known as polyuria, as well as severe nausea and vomiting that will come along. Now, let me ask you a question. With our patients that have really, really profound dehydration, what are some of the things that we need to be worried about as far as paramedics? Blood pressure would be one. Why is that? Why does the blood pressure drop? You're right. Keep, keep going down that road. Outstanding, Claire. Good job. Really, really good job. Yeah, you're right. So as we begin to lose fluid, the fluid begins to come out of the vasculature and our blood pressure begins to fall. What other non-fluid related problem should we be concerned about with patients with severe dehydration? Say it again. Well, that comes about, that's going to be a symptom of your dehydration. It's a cardiac issue. Could you ask the question again? Yeah. Decreased Decrease what? Mm, that's part of the dehydration. That's part of, part of the, the fluid loss. So let me, let me, re let, let me re restate the question. What other, this isn't directly related to the fluid. It comes about because of fluid loss. But what other problem should you be concerned about for your patients that are, have severe dehydration? Mm -mm. No, you'll see. You'll see. Um, you'll see a tachycardia, obviously, and that was, you know, uh, one one of the things that I, that we stressed in three ten. Again, if if you want to go some, so it can lead into problems with kidney function. But again, the thing I'm thinking about here that's most important is electrolytes. Remember, when you are vomiting out a lot of stuff and you are urinating profusely, again polyuria. So when you become dehydrated, one of the big things you want to watch for with your patients are electrolytes abnormalities. Now, again, you guys are going to be in the course of your career, you all are going to be drawing point of care labs. And so you're going to be able to measure some of these electrolytes by the bedside. And this is going to be especially true if you go into community paramedicine. So understanding the fact of the role that electrolytes play, not only from a cardiac perspective, but also just from a general body functioning perspective is going to be really, really important. All right. Now, somebody had mentioned something about kidney function. And again, basically what we would see in here is that our patients now begin to spill over some of the glucose into the urine. Okay, and so uh, often, sometimes through a urinalysis, the first signs and symptoms that a patient is a diabetic is they go and they see their doctor for whatever reason, they're tired or they can't focus their eyes or whatever reason, and, and, and they'll do a urinalysis and they'll come back and, and blood sugar will be, I mean, uh, uh, glucose in the urine will be really, really high. Back in the 1800s, true story, I don't make this up, they used to taste the urine to find out if a patient was diabetic. That's what I call dedication, okay? And that's probably more dedication than, than what I would have. Now, basically, as we're looking at this, again, as the glucose concentration goes up and it gets into the kidneys, two things happen. Number one is it gets spilled into the urine What's the second thing that can happen to the kidneys as this glucose stays elevated? Damage how? Yes, you're right. Yeah. 
you got them both. You got them both. So good. So it the the glucose, the elevated glucose over a long period of time, if it is not controlled and taken care of, it begins in particular to to destroy the structural component of the kidneys, and then much like every place else, the brain, the eyes, and the heart, it begins to break down the vasculature, leading to a decreased perfusion of those organs, and as such, then we begin to have cell death from our, from our patient, all right? Now, typically what we're going to see here is that when the blood glucose gets to about 300, that's when it begins to spill out into the urine, okay? So that kind of gives you a little bit of a correlation of exactly what's, what's going to be happening. So if you do, and we don't do, uh, at least on a regular basis, we don't do uh, urinalysis or, or uh, glucose dip tests uh, at, the, at the bedside. Now, a lot of y'all are gonna be working in, in the hospital and you will be doing that type of, of test. But the thing to keep in mind is that when you run your, your, uh, your, your finger sticks, if that blood sugar is 300 or higher, understand that we've got an elevated amount of glucose that is going through the kidney and that could potentially uh, run into a problem with our patient as far as damage to the kidney as well as exacerbation of the dehydration. The body reacts with an elevated heart rate. The body reacts with a drop blood pressure. They begin to go into hypovolemic shock and it's a vicious cycle. They can drink all that they want, but guess what? the body is going to continue to lose it either by vomiting and or by urination. Now, when we're looking at these particular patients, one hallmark sign or symptom typically shows up with these patients. What is that? Say it again. Kussmaul respirations definitely comes into play there but that will occur after our patient loses consciousness, okay? So you are correct. Kussmaul respiration, and remember, Kussmaul respirations is what? How do you describe Kussmaul respirations? Say it again. It's a VTAC of breathing. I like that. Where did you learn that? Pretty sure you said it. Oh, I did? I thought that sounds really cool. I couldn't have said that. But yeah, it is the VTAC of breathing. I like that. Landon. Yeah, we got a fruity smelling breath. And one of the, Martina. I didn't know if you were doing just like a huge part, like right now, on set. But also, I'm Yes. So these patients, again, they'll lose a lot of weight primarily because they're really hungry, they're really thirsty, but everything that they eat comes right back up. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, so in, again, because there's no glucose there for the body to metabolize, then it breaks down the fat and the protein. And so, over a long period of time, these patients can really begin to lose a lot of muscle, and this leads to huge issues, particularly with older patients. Who remember, a good muscular system helps us to maintain our balance, keeps us from falling. As we get older then these patients fall because they stumble and they can't regain their balance. Richard. Isn't this one of the uh, big reasons why the uh, keto diet is actually potentially dangerous? Any diet that you take to an extreme is dangerous, but in essence, the keto diet puts you into DKA, a type of mild DKA. Because what's happening in here is that you're dramatically reducing the amount of carbohydrates that you're eating and you're increasing the amount of protein. Now, one of the problems with the DKA or the, the keto diet is that 
uh, people with renal problems, renal failure, kidney transplant, if it, it's an effective diet, you'll lose weight. You'll lose quite a bit of weight. But remember, the, the premise is to eat more protein, all right? Well, the more protein you eat, the harder it is on your kidneys. And so you got to be really, really careful and watch that very, very closely. But yeah, you're exactly right. That's exactly what happens with, uh, with the keto diet as far as uh, uh, weight loss. So what do we do for this? Well, basically for DKA, for your perspective and mine, is that we've got to try to manage dehydration and acidosis. Now, there's a couple of different ways that we will do this and we'll manage the dehydration with fluid replacement and we can manage the, uh, the acidosis with insulin. Now, I say that because I will tell you Pre-hospital, you're probably never going to give insulin. But again, one of the things that we stress in this program is a lot of y'all are going to be working in non-pre-hospital situations. You're going to be working in physician's offices. You're going to be working in ERs or ICUs. So we're going to talk about insulin, particularly regular insulin here in just a little bit as far as what it, what it does. Martina, do you have a question? So one of the things that we're able to do is when we give our fluid bolus for our patient, generally what we're going to do is that we're going to, a couple things from a, from a bolus. Number one is we're going to replace the fluid the patient has lost either through urination and or from vomiting. Second thing we're going to do is that we're going to begin to dilute the concentration of the sugar. Now, blood sugar is not going to go down because we give a fluid bolus. But what we are going to be able to do is to slow down that concentration or lower that concentration to slow down the damage that it does to the vasculature so that we can get them to the hospital and then they can begin to bring the sugar down, the glucose down more gradually. So probably do something like LR and then maybe a couple that with D5W or something like that? Or? Now remember, as far as we wouldn't want to give D5W, it's not going to hurt them, but again, the last thing we need to do is to give them more glucose. Right. Okay, so we're going to stay away from D5. It's going to be rare that you're really ever going to administer D5 for your patients anymore. LR would be a good one. It's a good start, but that's not in the amount or the concentration of electrolytes in the LR that will help to offset that as much as what? Now, we kind of talked about, and if this may have been in trauma. So if it is, I apologize, but we'll talk about it. Why would LR in the DKA patient be a better choice of solution than normal saline? Normal saline is acidotic. And so we don't want to make our pay, or let me back up. Normal saline is more acidotic than LR. And we don't want to make our patient more acidotic as far as when we're, we're going through. Now, again, yes, ma'am. The only reason why I would think that even though you say LR, normal saline, because I think that's what they Concentrate. So much that we're putting more uh, electrolytes. Are you talking about the 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 electrolytes in the LR or what they've lost? No. Well, they lost fluid, but what I'm thinking is dehydration is that when you take it out of the cell, it's not going to be able to get the So let me let me clear your thinking up just a little bit. So I, I understand what you're what you're saying. Or let me let me repeat and, and make sure I understand. So what you're saying is that your premise is as the patient loses the fluid, the electrolytes remain behind and now they become more concentrated. Actually, what happens is that as the fluid goes, so do the electrolytes. So instead of the electrolytes being very really concentrated in a small amount of volume. 
actually you would have very low electrolytes in a very small amount of volume. And so the other thing to keep in mind is that we're typically not going to be able to really make a huge difference in the electrolyte amount by giving them LR. That's going to require some specialized drips when they, once they get to the hospital. The other thing that we want to do is that, again, we don't want to give our fluid so fast that we put our patient into pulmonary edema or flash pulmonary edema. So we want to listen to their breath sounds as far as uh, uh, we're, we're giving this medicine because we now don't want to make their diabetic problem, Haley, into a cardiovascular problem. Now, the other thing, Richard. So would you consider a 60 drop set instead of like a 10 drop set for this case? No, because 60 drops is going to be too slow. That's a micro drip. And so we do need to, to give the fluid in there. And we're still going to follow the 20 mil per kg uh, fluid bolus um, okay. equation that we're, go that we're going to give. All right. Now, you can, if you have any concerns, you can cut that in half and start out with 10 milligrams per kilogram and then increase it as you're, as you're going up. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, guys, we want to get the fluid in, so use a large gauge IV needle, okay, catheter, and you want it to be short. You don't want it to be long. Now, that's kind of an oxymoron because it's been my experience that diabetics have the worst veins. Okay, and so you go with whatever you can get. Keep in mind that you want to go with the largest uh, IV catheter that you can get so that you can get the fluids in quickly if you need to, but you can always back them down if you, if you don't. Now, when we're looking at this, again, don't overload your patient with fluid, Haley. You want to make sure you're listening to breath sounds as you're administering and giving out the, the fluid as it's, as it's going through. Now, here's the other thing to keep in mind. As your patient now gets into a situation of where they are urinating off and vomiting off, one of the things that comes, comes back to what you were saying, Martina, is that we now can begin to see the potassium to begin to rise. Again, the big thing that you need to remember, and everybody in here is either in 303 or has taken 303, is we're looking for that peaked T wave to look to identify that we've got some type of a potassium abnormality that's going to be in there, okay? Now, when we're uh, looking at this and uh, ad addressing this, this is going to be really, really important because, again, we don't want to overwhelm our patient with, with potassium. Now, giving the fluids, you're not going to have to worry about that at that point in time, but just kind of keep that in mind. Now, here's the other thing that happens. When you give a patient insulin, if their potassium is elevated... One of the side effects, which is a good one, is that it will move the potassium from the blood back into the cell where it's safe, all right? Now remember, when we have free potassium that's floating around, it gets to the heart. What danger do we have with an elevation in the volume or the amount of potassium, and what danger does that have on our patient's heart? Cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest. Uh, now keep in mind, like I've shared before, in states that use lethal injection for capital punishment, a massive dose of potassium is one of the drugs that they give to instantly stop your patient's heart. Well, we don't want our patient to suffer that from, from DKA. So again, kind of keep that in mind. The insulin will move the, the potassium out of the blood and back into the cell. Devin. So now, 
Keep in mind, now, uh, again, the, the, uh, the acidosis that is coming from here, is it a metabolic acidosis or is it a respiratory acidosis? It is a metabolic acidosis. But, now, here's the thing to keep in mind. The use of bicarb for DKA is very controversial, and you probably should not use it. Yeah, it would work, but the problem with it is if we give an amp of bicarb, or even a half of an amp of bicarb, now we go from acidotic whew, to alkalotic. Remember we, t we talked about in a previous lecture about why we don't give D50 anymore like we used to. We took a blood sugar from 30 up to a blood sugar of 4 or 500 in a matter of minutes. That's not good on the brain. But how much is enough? That's the question. You don't know. You don't know. So basically what will happen is that when they get to the hospital, they will begin to reverse the acidosis, but they will do it slowly because there's less side effects. Remember, the body doesn't like radical change happening over a very short period of time. The body doesn't mind having change over a long period of time as long as it has a little bit of time to get used to what is going on. Good observation, though. Uh, Martin, do you have something else? Outside, Say it again? It's kind of like how it got cold outside real fast, and I don't like that. Yeah, you don't want to do that. That's, that's not really good. So let's take a look a little bit at insulin. All right? Insulin is a hormone. What do hormones do? Tell me more. What do hormones do? It's a chemical that causes the body to do something. Excellent. So it is a catalyst type of agent. A hormone comes around and it causes something else to happen. Insulin gets into the body and it causes the cells to open up and now the glucose to go in. All right? Now, Indications, hyperglycemia, we want to bring the blood sugar down. Uh, Insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus or type 1 diabetes or hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is what? Hyperkalemia is high calcium? Potassium. High potassium. Now, again, one of the things that you may be called upon to do, especially if you're working in a hospital, in a clinical facility, or if you are functioning as a, a community paramedic, is that you may be called upon to help with or the administration of insulin for patients that have high potassium. And again, remember, it just simply, it doesn't dissolve, it doesn't eliminate, Haley, the, the, the potassium in the blood, just simply it changes places. It changes from just kind of floating around in the blood to now moving it into the cell where it's locked in place and it can have less of a potential negative danger on the on our patient. There are some, some uh, side effects, some that can be major, and that's why you want to watch it. Number one, is that it can cause your patient to go from a blood sugar of 400 down to 40, just like we talked about with D50 going from the opposite direction to too high. So that's why you want to watch your patients. You want to observe them. As part of that process, we have an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So they get anxious, they get jittery, their heart rate goes up, they get confused. Uh, in, in, the, in bad situations, now we can run into problems of our patient going into um, insulin shock. And remember, insulin shock is the same thing as a serious hypoglycemic reaction, really, really low. And then ultimately, obviously, if we're moving potassium out of the blood and into the cell, we could actually cause our patient to have a low free calcium or free potassium count in the blood itself. Obviously, we know that as far as your contraindications, uh, if your patient got a low blood sugar, don't give them insulin. Okay, that's not going to help. That's only going to make their blood sugar even lower when you're doing that. So, what's your dosing regimen? Okay, 
So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to give 0.1 units. Okay, insulin comes in units, not milligrams or micrograms or milliliters. A 0.1 units per kilogram. Now understand that if your patient is in shock because, let me back up. If your patient's in hypovolemic shock, think about what the circulation is to the skin. What is the state of the circulation to the skin? Well, yeah. So in shock, the blood is shunted away from the skin into the core. And so literally, it may take a long time for this insulin to begin to, to come into play. You can potentially start an IV drip of insulin. But again, that's probably only going to happen within the confines of the, of the hospital. Now, insulin, regular insulin in particular, has a relatively short half-life, which means what for our patient? Why, why is the, it was the half-life important? Say it again, Sydney. Yeah, it won't last that long. And if, when it begins to wear off, what happens to our patient's blood sugar? It goes back up. And so our patient's back in the same situation that, that we're in. If we're giving sub-Q or IM insulin, always use an insulin syringe because you're not going to draw up very much and the insulin syringe is uh, divided up so that you can draw up very, very minute amounts of insulin in units and not make a medication error. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, as the last bullet says here, is that the time of onset as well as the half-life depends upon the person as well as what's going on in the person. If you've got a patient that's mildly in hypovolemic shock because they've only lost a little bit of fluid, then the onset of insulin is probably going to be quicker than if you've got somebody who is in profound shock. So remembering what we're doing in this situation is we're doing this in an emergency situation because we've got an extremely high blood sugar that has been that high for a very long time. Your point is well taken, but again, that sliding scale that patients do based upon what their blood sugar is going to be is going to come about as a result of a much lower blood sugar, probably somewhere in the 1 to 200 range. With DKA, it's not unusual to find patients that will have four, five, six hundred, and even more. We can go into uh, what used to be called HHNK, hyperosmolar, non ketotic uh, diabetic coma, uh, which is basically the exact same thing, except you don't smell the fruity breath because there's no ketones being formed. Richard, what did you say? Oh, I was just saying, that's uh, generally a maintenance dose. Right. On that scale. Yep, you're exactly right. For our patients, let's say that you've got a patient that uh, comes into your ER and now they've gotten, let's say that, um, let's say you've got a 20-year-old that decides that they don't want to live. And they got into his grandmother's potassium chloride because she's got a heart condition. And his potassium is through the roof. Potassium seven, eight, nine, really, really high. Even though he's not a diabetic, we will probably be administering, again, in the hospital situation, uh, insulin, generally going to be uh, 10 units. And we can give that IV. We're going to give that. One of the best ways to do this is to mix it in with um, some, some D50 or D25 again, to lower the potassium level. But remember, why are we giving the concentrated dextrose along with that?
Yeah. Good, Martina. Yeah, you're exactly right. So what we don't want to do is that we don't want to wipe out this patient's supply of glucose in his body, even though he's not a diabetic, okay? Remember, this is a, this is a scenario in which you got a 20-year-old that, that's trying to commit suicide by taking heart medicine, potassium-based heart medicine. We want to get that potassium out of the blood itself, but we also want to replace the glucose that is also going to be introduced into the into the cell, all right? Now, here's the thing, and we should be doing this all the time. Verify your dose before you give any medicine, all right? Now, your EMT partner can do that, okay? Everybody should have a rudimentary knowledge of drug math, okay, or how to use a drug math app. All right, so just have somebody confirm how much you're giving as far as before you get it. Because once you give medicine, in most cases, it's just impossible to pull it back out. Okay, any questions about the diabetic medicines, we're going to switch over into anaphylaxis now. All right, as far as the human body goes, we've got a really elaborate system for protecting ourselves against any type of foreign invading uh, bacteria or viruses or any type of anything else that comes into the body. This is known as the immune system. And basically what it's designed to do is to reduce any harmful effects when we get something in the body that the body recognizes is not supposed to be there. Now, the immune system has many backup systems as well as it works with other systems in the body to help to keep the, the system or the uh, poisons out of the body that should not be there. It basically identifies these as uh, what they're called. They're called antigens, A-N-T-I-G-E-N-S. So it identifies these antigens and then it begins to form specific substances that will literally begin to surround and dissolve and eliminate these particular substances that are not supposed to be in there. Now, as a result of that, what is left from the destruction of that antigen is a new specific type of substance called an antibody, okay? And these antibodies are there to help to monitor and to eliminate any type of future threat that that particular antigen may bring about. Now, once it's bound up to the antigen that comes in itself, these antibodies can destroy the antigen in multiple different ways. And that's beyond the scope of this class to be able to do that. Or it will help it to be eliminated either by the breath by the urine, or through a bowel movement, or a combination of both of these. The problem with is that the body often doesn't recognize certain things as being as part of the body. And then it turns on itself, and it begins to destroy certain normal cells. And that is called an autoimmune disease, where the body begins to break down certain parts. One of the things that happens in uh, muscular uh, multiple sclerosis is that the body looks at the covering of the nerve cells, which is much like the covering of an electrical cord, and will begin to attack that. That's the, the covering is known as a myelin sheath. And it'll begin to destroy that myelin sheath, exposing the nerve itself. Now, if I took a knife and I started trimming off this covering off of this cord, bad things would happen. I, you know, be bad enough that I would probably burn down or burn my computer up. Maybe I'd destroy the uh, projection system. Worst case scenario, maybe the building would catch on fire. Similar thing happens as far as whenever the body begins to attack itself. Systems begin to fail and we have a number of harmful effects. Now, 
this antigen antibody system is designed to help to keep people alive, okay? But we can get an exaggerated response that instead of an allergic reaction, now becomes known as an anaphylactic reaction. When this happens, the body begins to secrete different types of chemicals within the body itself, primarily histamine, serotonin, and other types of chemicals that lead to the problems that we see with anaphylaxis. And within anaphylaxis, ladies and gentlemen, what are the major issues? We typically have three. What are, what are they? As a result of what? So we have airway obstruction as a result of? So not swelling as much as it is bronchoconstriction. Okay? So we get bronchoconstriction. I'll come right to you, Martina. What's the second thing that happens? So that's your respiratory component. The other two are cardiovascular. The increased heart rate would come about as the body is trying to compensate. So you are correct. As a result of what? What did you say, Claire? Not enough circulation. That's true as a result of vasodilation. So the blood vessels now get really, really big. And histamine is the big player in that. But wait, there's more. What else happens to the blood vessels? They get little holes in them. Yeah, and then and, and what happens when we get little holes in the blood vessels? Plasma begins to leak out, which does what to our blood pressure, Claire? It drops it down even more. Martino. Okay. So again, these are the three things that we're looking at happening with, uh, with our patient in anaphylaxis. In particular, guys, make sure you remember that histamine is the major player here. You'll probably see that one again. So as we go through, these now begin to uh, exhibit and to show the signs and symptoms of a patient having an anaphylactic type of reaction. Now, an allergic reaction can be minor. So for example, if a patient gets stung, it swells, it burns, it hurts. That's an allergic reaction. So that's a minor one. It affects only one body system, or we can have a major anaphylactic reaction that literally begins to affect multiple body systems, okay? In particular, the respiratory system, the cardiac system, and the GI system, okay? Now I'll come right to you, Richard. With the GI system, one of the things we see with this release of histamine is it causes our patient to vomit. Why is that a problem? Because of our airway. We already have an airway problem, and the last thing we want to do, Sydney, is to put a bunch of vomitus down into it. Richard. So can you have a um, major allergic reaction that affects major systems that isn't anaphylaxis? Say that again. So anaphylaxis is, you know, obstruction of the airway along with affection of the cardiac system. Is there a, a major allergic reaction that affects multiple systems but doesn't cause anaphylaxis? Claire's shaking her head. Claire, what, what is it? What? Help me out here then. Okay, so yeah, and that would be a type of anaphylactic reaction that would basically involve your vascular system uh, again. So what, I, what I'm trying to think of is if there would be a time when you would have an anaphylactic cis reaction that would not involve either the respiratory or the pulmonary, and I don't think that there could be. I think it would have to involve one or both of those. So. Ultimately, I would have to say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, all right? 
Now, when we're when we've got this anaphylactic uh, reaction is going on, if treatment is not rather rapid, our patient's going to die. They're going to suffocate, and they'll go into cardiac arrest. Now, the typical progression that we see for these patients is that it starts out where the skin now begins to get red. They begin to have this really warm sensation and they develop a rash. And then that rash begins to coalesce and develop hives. It's also known as urticaria. You might want to remember that because that'll be the word that will be used on your registry exam if they use it. Can you spell that? U-R-T-I-C-A-R-I-A. So like I said, your patient can feel warm and flush. They may feel like that their lips and their mouth and their throat are beginning to, to swell. And again, they can have watery eyes and a runny nose. We all experience those symptoms in the, in the spring, okay? And, and that's the same type of system that's happening, except it's not anaphylaxis down Sydney, but it is simply just going to be an allergic reaction. The key here ladies and gentlemen, is you got to determine with your patient assessment, is a patient having an allergic reaction or is it moving into anaphylaxis? And if it's not into anaphylaxis yet, is there a possibility that our patient could go into anaphylaxis? Now, one of the things to keep in mind, and it's a really scary thing, you know, we're talking about patients that get stung by yellow jackets or, or wasps, that's a common type of instigating event. Sometimes people will go out and eat shellfish, and that can cause an allergic reaction. Sometimes people will eat some type of nuts, primarily peanuts, and that can lead into an anaphylactic reaction. You may have experienced all of these all of your life, and you get up into your adult years, your middle-aged years, or even older, and then all of a sudden you eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, never had a problem before, and now you have an anaphylaxis, which is really kind of scary uh, when, you, when you begin to think about it. But the other thing to keep in mind is that generally, the more rapid the onset of symptoms, the more severe the reaction is going to be. So if your patient says, yeah, this kind of came up and it, 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 it started developing over about an hour and 90 minutes. Most of the time, I'm not telling you not to transport or, or not to treat your patient, but I'm telling you most of the time your patient's not going to go into a severe anaphylactic reaction. Watch them closely, okay? Remember, when we're assessing our patients, we're assessing for sick, not sick, or not yet sick, okay? Basically, could be sick far as when we're going in there, all right? Now, rash and hives are the most common manifestation of an allergic reaction, and the quicker that those have an onset, the more severe that uh, the result is going to be. Now, as we're looking at this, then, basically, you can see the progression that we would see in this particular uh, graphic. Once a histamine has been released, then we run into bronchospasm, and vasodilation leading to both respiratory and cardiac issues. The vasodilation causes us to go into a hypovolemic type of uh, shock, which ultimately, even though our heart rate is increasing, our preload is going to drop, which means our cardiac output eventually drops and our patient goes into shock. So what do we do for this? Well, your primary treatment for severe anaphylaxis is going to be the administration of epinephrine. Now, we've already covered epinephrine, so this is just basically going to be a review. So epinephrine is considered as an adrenergic agonist. Adrenergic sounds like adrenaline. Agonist means it helps it to happen, okay? So it's going to have the same effects as adrenaline because it is adrenaline, okay? It's also an endotropic. An endotropic would mean what? That's dromotropy. So Martina did this back there just a minute ago, and that's exactly right. So the force of contraction, in and out, in and out, endotropy, 
is going to be increased, okay? Epinephrine is a good drug because it works on both the alpha and the beta 1 and beta 2 receptors. So it hits all of them and helps our patient to, to recover by increasing the respiratory, or I'm sorry, increasing the blood pressure as well as bringing about bronchodilation for our, for our patient. Now, anytime we're going to give epinephrine, understand that we are putting the sympathetic nervous system on, on hyperdrive. And so anxiety, jitteriness, headache, uh, nausea, vomiting, blood pressure is going to go up. All of these are going to be potential side effects of your, of your administration. Contraindications are a number of them that are going to be there. Obviously, if we've got a patient that is already hypertensive, we want to be really careful about administering this to the patient. Again, I, would, I don't think I've ever seen a patient with severe anaphylaxis that has also had a really high blood pressure. It just doesn't go together because of the vascular collapse that is inherent with, uh, with anaphylaxis. Richard? treat what's going to kill them first so would you if they're not breathing would you give it anyway even if they do some for some reason have hypertension i you know i might consider administering albuterol if they're, if they're not breathing because of bronchospasm but yeah pretty much you know you're going to have to treat what's going to kill them first and without a respiratory drive or a respiratory airway to get air into the alveoli they're going to be dead fairly quickly so yeah uh your adult dose uh, is it going to be anywhere from 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams of a 1 to 1,000 solution? So we're going to give the strong one there, okay? And we're going to give that every 5 to 15 minutes until our symptoms begin to resolve. Don't worry about the dosage on there for uh, an IV effusion. I won't ask you about that. At this point, you don't need to be worrying about it. Any questions on epinephrine? Let's talk about diphenhydramine. Diphenhydramine is the same thing as what we typically call Benadryl, okay? It's an antihistamine. So in other words, it blocks the action of histamine, okay? Now, the nice thing about um, uh, Benadryl or diphenhydramine is it takes a little bit longer to work, but it also lasts longer than does epinephrine, okay? And so what we're going to do is indicate it in our patients that have anaphylactic reactions. So once we give our patient epinephrine and we begin to see their symptoms dissipate, then we want to follow that up with a dose of Benadryl. And typically our dose that we're going to give is going to be between 25 to 50 milligrams Again, this depends upon the size of the patient, okay? You've got somebody my size, probably going to need about 50 milligrams. Martina, you got somebody a laying size, you might even want to consider 12 and a half milligrams, and you can tell her I said that, okay? So, yeah, she's tiny. Don't make her mad, though, okay? Some of the side effects you're going to see is the most common one is we all know that it's going to make people sleepy. Okay, except there's something about giving Benadryl to some kids that it actually has the opposite effects and, and it sets them off and it makes them really, really hyper, as you can see in the, in the, the area there. Uh, it, it also will cause really dry mucous membranes, so, you're, so the people that take it are typically going to be pretty thirsty to try to offset some of uh, that drying that's going on. Richard. You mentioned thickening of mucus, so would, um, probably gonna get it backwards, would um, Ronchi be possible there? Potentially, but now keep in mind that you're usually are not going to have a lot of mucus in the alveoli as a result of anaphylaxis. The big issue right there is gonna be the narrowing of the bronchial. So, yeah, if they're, I guess it is possible. Let's say worst case scenario, you got a patient that's got pneumonia and they get stung by a bee and now they've got pneumonia and anaphylaxis and we take care of it with epinephrine and then we give them Benadryl, then that mucus may get thicker as well, potentially, okay? 
Contraindications is we want to be really careful if we've got a patient that has asthma, all right? That's a relative contraindication. And your dose is going to be 25 to 50 milligrams. And we can either give it IV, IO, IM, or PO, PO being by mouth. How awful would it be if someone was having an allergic reaction or were allergic to Benadryl? I had one patient That's that was so allergic to Benadryl one would time. You, what'd you do? I gave them epinephrine. Gave them epinephrine, and then I went with this next drug that we're going to talk about. So, yeah, it was really kind of weird That's when you so think, awful. you know, we give ep we give Benadryl, diphenhydramine for people that are allergic to it, but this person was allergic to it. So, so another room on my page. You can't have another drug. Sorry. Nice drug we're going to talk about, Cymedrol. Cymedrol is a steroid, okay? And basically the big thing that we use solumedra for, for is, or any steroid, is to reduce inflammation. Okay, now we can get some inflammation within the bronchioles, but the big thing that we see with the bronchioles is going to be constriction. But, again, the thing with steroids, and remember, we're stair-stacking these medicines. We give epinephrine for immediate relief, short duration, it begins to wear off. We give diphenhydramine for, it takes longer for it to begin to act, probably about 30 minutes to maybe 40 minutes for it to begin to act, but now we have a longer uh, duration. Cortical steroids are generally going to take like an hour, maybe two hours to begin to act, but they're going to act for maybe 10, 12, 16 hours afterwards and allows the body to become back more into, into balance. Again, all three of these disease processes that you see here come about as a result, have some component of inflammation in it. Some of the, some of the side effects that you're going to see is uh, patients that get injectable steroids can become very hyper, okay? And they can swing one of two directions as far as their mood. They can go over here and be really euphoric and really happy and very nice to be around. Or, or you're exactly right. They can come over here with kind of roid rage. I remember when I was getting my first kidney transplant, I was walking the hallways with my wife because they had given me 600 milligrams of IM steroid in preparation. And later on, it was kind of like I was walking the hallway and I looked over at my wife and I said, I just feel like killing something. And that's totally unlike me, you know, but it was, it was, it was the steroids talking, man. It was the steroids Jesus. talking. Jesus. The you other thing, Devin yet? Listen. no, I hadn't, had I? Listen. So other side effects is that steroids will dramatically increase your appetite. And so if you are on a steroid pack, you're sick, and they put you on a, on a, a, a solumedrol pack, generally that's for about a week. Some things that's not going to happen is, number one, you're probably not going to sleep. And if you do, it's not going to sleep very well. You might as well snack, uh, stack up, uh, stock up with snacks because you're going to eat everything in the house, whether you like it or not. You're going to, be, you're going to get hungry. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it works pretty well. Contraindications for our patient, obviously Cushing syndrome. I'd encourage you to do a little bit of research on what Cushing syndrome is. The other thing that we're looking at here is um, it's, it's used with precaution in hypertension because it can make high blood pressure worse. Why? Because it causes fluid retention, which can lead to an increase in your patient's blood pressure. So that's the thing that you kind of want to want to watch and look for there. Here's your dose for solumedrols. We're going to give a half to one milligram. We can give it IV every 12 hours, which basically means we're going to give one dose, okay? And the duration, like I said, will be anywhere from 12 to 16 hours. So, ladies and gentlemen, 